Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome uh, to this International Day of Peace, the 21st of September, right around the world. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you, and we're excited to be bringing you um, one of our major uh, events this morning, this featured event, Paths to Inner and Outer Peace, with Jonathan Granoff and Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. Um, Jonathan, Gwendolyn, welcome. Welcome to Peace Week. Thank you. It's an honor to be. It's an honor to be with you, Ben. It's great work that Unity Earth and Unify and uh, and, and John Raymer's networks and just all the people that are trying to weave us together in one web of unity. Thank you, brother. It's a very exciting time, and we're really excited to have you uh, and Gwendolyn join us today for this rich conversation. Let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. I'm going to start um, with you, uh, Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. PhD is Professor Emerita in Religious and African American Studies and Affiliated Faculty in Women's Studies at the University of Florida. She obtained her BA from Antioch University in Human Services, near MA, uh, her MA in Religious Studies, and her PhD in Islamic Studies from Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, uh, Zahra has got such an extraordinary uh, career with so many different high points and amazing chapters going all the way back to being active in the civil rights movement during a freshman year at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia in 1962. Uh, what a history, what an amazing journey uh, that you've been on. And through that, being part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, and going um, all the way through to working in that Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, in the New York office. Uh, through throughout so so many years, um, beyond that, just an incredible amount of uh, different posts and positions throughout your career, uh, right across the United States, um, and really working full time in the movement. She was a uh, field director for the project Women uh, Women Power, uh, and later with the American Friends Service Committee, um, where she's been an instrumental creator. Uh, let me also say um, that Zahara has conducted research um, as a Fulbright scholar in Jordan, Egypt, Palestine, and Syria um, on the Sharia impact on women contem contemporarily and the women's movement in those countries to change these laws. Um, Simmons is a prolific public speaker on college and university campuses, as well as in community forums. Uh, she's featured in several films on the civil rights movement and on women and Islam. Additionally, she has written numerous articles and essays on the civil rights movement and on women in Islam. So extraordinary. We're very honoured to have you with us, uh, Zahara, here today, this morning in Peace Week. The honour is mine. Thank you. What, a, what an extraordinary career. Now, Jonathan Granoff, of course, has a similarly long and extensive bio, um, but uh, uh, here are some of the highlights. Jonathan Granoff is president of the Global Security Institute. Uh, he's a permanent observer uh, to the United Nations of the International Anti-Corruption Academy. He's representative to the United Nations, the World Summit of Nobel Peace Prize laureates. He's a fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science. And since his youth, has been a student of the Sufi saint, Bawa Muhayyadeen. And he is honoured uh, to be his namesake, having been given the name by the saint himself, to be given the name Ahmed. Mukhayadin. Um, so, brother, brother Ahmed, brother Jonathan, man with many names, uh, thank you so much for being with us and uh, for gracing us all on this special day, this blessed day, this international day of peace. Jonathan Grenoff. Yeah, every day, of course, is a propitious day to see the sunrise and remember what brings us here. But, you know, you can't see the beauty of the sunrise if your heart's disturbed, if, you're, if you have jealousy, anger, anxiety, you, if, uh, selfishness, egocentricity. You don't see the majesty of the sunrise. You just don't see it. But when the heart is free, when there's inner peace, when there's love in the heart, then every sunrise, every day is a miraculous event. And every seed turning into a tree is a miracle. And every breath that we take is a breath of, of grace and gift. So I want to begin our session with, with, um, with a, a, a true spiritual sister who has, for me, 
over many, many decades been an example of steadfastness, diligence, commitment, wisdom, and goodness. Uh, but I want to begin for all of us this day of peace, shanti, salam. And peace comes from the qualities that require peace. There's no justice without peace, and there's no peace without justice. There's no love without peace, and there's no peace without love. All of these divine qualities that live to give us life from the emanation of light from the soul bring us together. So may that love that's born of that unity, the love that comes from being one family, the love that comes from a heart of gratitude, the love that has no limit, that gives life to all of us, that brought being into space and time, the love that will never break or fail because it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the Creator, and the Creator blesses us with it, but we don't own it, it owns us. May that love that compels and that we came into this world with and we looked into our mother's eyes and fell in love. May that love guide our hearts and give us the wisdom to bring the peace that we know lives in our hearts into this very troubled world. But let us always remember there is unity. Whether we see it or not, it is reality. There is grace. Whether we experience it or not, it is part of reality. And there is infinite love whether we see it or not. So may we have the hearts that can see it and know it and be it. So now I want to go right to uh, my sister, and I want to start early in her life because something called her to an extraordinary, extraordinary endeavor of courage, I mean, unbelievable courage, commitment, and clarity that has helped free so many people. It took us out of Jim Crow and American apartheid into a world in which it's not extraordinary that we had a president, uh, a man of color, and we have a vice president whose heritage is from South Asia, a woman. We wouldn't have this, but for what happened in the 1960s in the South in America, when there were people who stood up and said, enough is enough, enough is enough. Enough is enough, and they put their lives on the line. So, Zahar, um, uh, share with us a little bit about your journey when you're still a teenager. What brought you to the What brought you to the streets? What guided you, and what did you experience so that we can sh share in that? And don't hold anything back, please. Well, thank you so much, my brother Ahmed, and thank you to all who have organized this gathering. And thank you so much for your opening words about the unity that exists, whether we are aware of it or not. Um, I was raised in the apartheid era in the Jim Crow South, uh, and I was brought up in a very devout uh, Christian home. Uh, you know, we began the day with prayer. We ended it with prayer. Uh, we did Bible readings. Uh, we were in church uh, many times during the week, et cetera. And in my home, in my church, and in my school, uh, you know, we were taught God is love and that um, we, all of us, were children of God and that there was no difference. And so, of course, I was hearing this from people who clearly believed it, but what I was living was a very different uh, story. And so trying to bring those two things together, and of course, as I became a teenager uh, and witnessing some of the things that were happening, like the Montgomery bus boycott, in 1957 and the integration of some of the schools. And it just became clear to me uh, in my heart. I mean, um, someone once wrote that I answered the call. And of course I was not uh, clear until much later 
when I met uh, our dearly beloved Sheikh Bawa Mahayadeen, that indeed it was an internal call that said, just as you said, Ahmed, enough, enough. This must end. And with God's help and guidance, we will end it. And so that was the sustaining thing for me and I believe all of my comrades and colleagues that put our bodies on the line, as we used to say, to uh, wake our country up and to wake our fellow Southerners up, our white Southern brothers and sisters, that this was not what God intended the way we were living and that we had to change it. And we were uh, committed uh, to that change. And I am so clear that God was guiding me every step of the way through so many violent encounters uh, where I thought life was getting ready to end. Uh, but it was clear that God was in the plan and I was leaning on God's everlasting arms, even though I didn't know it. You're 19 years old. You're leading a group of children. They're children. Yeah. And there's officers of the state with weapons before you. You're 19. And you've been taught that the path of life is the unconditional, nonviolent love of Jesus, King. But others, there were other voices, not just his. There were other men and women who had picked up the microphone, who had put their lives on the line. And you had this moment. You've, I've heard you tell. I heard you tell this once. I, I've had similar moments with guns in front of me too. It's that moment when you just are all in. You're not just putting your voice on the line. You're putting your body on the line. And you're relying not on your intelligence, not on not on the state's protection, which which is very easy for a, a white person like myself to take for granted, but you're relying on some greater power. Take us to that moment of decision that you had, please. Let share that with share that with our brothers and sisters. Yes, this was in Laurel, Mississippi, uh, where I had been assigned to be the project director during Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1964. And I was there for two years. And a number of our uh, members of our project had been arrested. And so I had called for a march to the jail in support of our brothers and sisters who were locked up. And the only people who showed up for the march were children. They were high school children. And I thought, oh, my God, well, we're going to go anyway. And so we were approaching the jail, and the uh, sheriff uh, was there, and he told us to turn back. And we were singing freedom songs, as we always did on these marches, and uh, one of our main freedom songs, you know, was that we were not going to let anybody turn us around. So we kept singing. Well, he pulled his gun from his holster and pointed it directly at me and said, girl, I told you to turn around. And for a second, I paused and then I whispered a prayer and I kept walking in the young People kept walking behind me and he actually started laughing and he said, girl, you're a damn fool. And he put his gun back in his holster and we marched on to the jail and completed our demonstration. Now, I really, I mean, you're talking about being, I know I was calling on God, but I had no idea if God was hearing me. So it was like, Oh, wow. And that was the way uh, it took place. I mean, it was mind boggling to me also. It was like, oh, God, thank you. 
<laughs> that's calling that's called being all in. Yes. And that's called love in action. Love in action. You know, Jane Goodall often says that the journey of our life is to go from the head to the heart. But I've had discussions with her and, and I said that this is incomplete. There's another part of it. And she knows exactly knew exactly where I was going. Because if you just take this the 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 love that God gives us that opens the organ of perception called the heart. It's not just an emotional center that's centered on me. It's an open space in which real wisdom and knowledge and courage can come. But if you get that and you don't act on it, if you don't act on that love, it becomes mere sentiment. And your spiritual awakening will kind of devolve into a warm bath and some candles and a massage. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not going to get, it's not going to get you to fly and it's not going to get you to soar. But if you let that love guide the hand, go from the head to the heart to the hand, then the miracle changes. Then the miracle, the miracle changes your world. We're not in charge of this world. We're put in this world to realize what put us in, into this world. Exactly. And when we have that pure intention and we bring it into action, things happen that you can't possibly, possibly ever imagine and then the, the 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 salty tears of despair, disappointment, betrayal, and 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 the and the uh, intrinsic suffering of birth, old age, sickness, and death, and the salt of loss and 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 betrayal and disappointment turns into the sugar and sweetness of opportunities to amplify that love and to serve. It turns into it turns into uh, uh, an intelligence that's guided by light. And, and and is imbued with the qualities of splendor and wonder and uh, and expectation and uh, uh, faith faith that's not based on ignorance but faith that's based on experience yes. and 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 then opportunities to serve that well Rumi said uh, one of Rumi's prayers is something along the lines oh God what you told the rose to open tell my heart to open you know, this happened at a very young age for you. And I know that one of the parts of your journey was that you're one of the leaders of the American Friends Service Committee. Now, I have a deep love for the Quaker philosophy and the American Friends Service Committee. And it came to me, I did a documentary on the creation of America. I won, I won some uh, film festival awards for that. And in order to do that, I studied deeply what the culture of Philadelphia was in the 1760s and 1770s. And the Quaker community was very powerful there, very powerful, and it deeply informed Benjamin Franklin, who was sort of the wise man who infused much of the principles of democracy and freedom in our conflicted constitution that also affirmed the legitimacy of slavery. But it has a seed of tremendous vision and virtue in it, largely because of the Quakers. and. After your journey, you know, putting it on the line with the civil rights movement and getting your college diplomas and everything, I know that you had a journey in the Quaker community. And, you know, I just, I, it's just so resonant with, with, with what you did as a young woman. And then as a, as a professional, you were instrumental with the, with the, with the international Quaker movement. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that part of your journey. Oh, certainly. Um, it's very uh, interesting how I became involved with uh, the Quakers and the American Friends Service Committee. Um, when I was uh, offered a job uh, in a project that they had, well, it was really before uh, I was offered the job because I was not sure that I wanted to apply for this position. Uh, I already had a job there in Philadelphia, and uh, it was working with young people, and I was enjoying uh, being sort of a mentor and a trainer, parent trainer, uh, when I was made aware of this. And so I went to Bawa, our dearly beloved spiritual father, and I asked him about this because I said, you know, I like where I am. It's a permanent job. This job at the American Friends Service Committee is uh, guaranteed for six months. 
And, uh, you know, I don't know about it. And so uh, Bawa looked uh, as he often did. We knew that he was studying deeply uh, what the outcomes and all would be. And uh, he said, I know the Quakers. I know them very well. And he said, yes, you should take this job with the Quakers. Uh, you, you will love them and they will love you. And of course, I knew uh, from experience that Bawa's advice would be the whatever he advised was what I should do. So what had been advertised as a six-month job turned into 23 years of me working with them. At that, at, at that session with Bawa, he said, they will send you around the world a few times to do good work. And I was like, around the world? Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'd never been outside of the United States. So it was like, I found that pretty shocking, but I believed him if he said it, you know? So indeed, that is exactly what happened. Um, I'll just mention uh, being sent with a delegation to Vietnam, since we're talking about peace, uh, after the end of the U.S.'s war on Vietnam and traveling by a van, by boat, however you could, because it was right after the war ended, and uh, the, seeing the destruction uh, from Hanoi to Saigon, and then unexpectedly being given the chance to go to Cambodia uh, right after the Vietnamese army had uh, been able to push Pol Pot out of uh, the major city uh, there in uh, Cambodia. And seeing that destruction, uh, while I always saw myself as nonviolent, but seeing the destruction and hearing from the victims of war uh, just uh, completely uh, solidified my commitment to work for peace uh, for the rest of my life. So you mentioned, um, well, I want to tell a story of my experience with, with, uh, with, with the Vietnamese uh, diplomats. I was, at a, I was at a conference in the Middle East with them and we were at a retreat. This was a conference that had uh, players from all, all the countries in the Middle East, uh, except Israel. Uh, but, uh, but there were people there who would want to build bridges with Israel for sure. And there were people that didn't. But there was a delegation for, for, with Vietnamese diplomats and I decided to have breakfast with them. And, and, I, and I said, I, 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 want to, I want to offer an apology for what my country did. I, I, I worked really hard to stop that war. I had guns put to my head by agents of the state. I had, I put it on the line just to work to stop that. But I, but my country did it anyway, and we didn't succeed. And I want to. And the head of the delegation said, well, "Don't apologize. We're so over that." And I felt that it really blew my mind. They really were not. They didn't have a victim's mentality. And I said. I said I've really experienced that 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 people from Vietnam and you don't have that victim's attitude. You know, you're not looking for reparations or vengeance or anything. You're just moving forward. What's that about? And she smiled and said, "Well, you have to understand we're Buddhists, and in Buddhism, the first duty you have is to be happy, and you can't be happy if you carry the past and live in anticipation of the future." So we don't live in the past. We live now. And, um, and I said, you know, I can really feel that. It's very powerful. Um, uh, but I thought you were communists. And she said, oh, no, no, that's just on the surface. And, you know, and I, I was friends with a, there was a great Buddhist monk, Maha, uh, Mahagosananda. And Mahagosananda was so powerful. He was a little guy. And he was so powerful that he went into the killing went into the, uh, the killing fields and stood in front of the Khmer Rouge 
looked them in the eye with his incredible presence and said, take me first. And he saved hundreds of thousands of lives, went through Cambodia. And uh, we were at a, a conference at Stanford University with some presidents, with the, the leaders of the university. And I asked him, do you have any anger for what the Khmer Rouge did? You know, they killed a, a seventh of the population of, of Cambodia in the most horrific ways over ideology. And he said to me, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. And I said, that's too, you know, that's a riddle. It's too cryptic. Just tell it to me straight. He said, every one of us has a camera that records every intention that we have and every deed that we do. And whatever we do that causes uh, benefit or injury to others, we have to experience. We have to experience what we've done. Mm. That's the law. And I want to experience loving kindness and compassion. That's all, I'm, that's all I want to experience. So I want my camera to record that. And those soldiers, they have their cameras. He never said the word God. But I have to say, it was one of the strongest affirmations of faith that I have ever heard. He didn't say, this is God's law. He just said, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. Um, so, Hari, you mentioned Bawa. Uh, uh, he was a, a small man, very, 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 very old, found in the jungles of Sri Lanka. And you were instrumental in bringing him to the Western world. You were uh, in Philadelphia, and somehow you knew you helped him get here with a small group of people. And I want, and and obviously, you know, when he emphasized that it would be good for you to be one of the leaders of the Quaker, a Sufi, a Sufi, and a, a quaking Sufi. <laughs> uh, you you said, yeah, that makes sense. I'll do it. You know, you had that faith. Um, just tell tell about like why what kind of what kind of uh, insight into things he had and what what you experienced with him that led you to have that kind of confidence. Well, you know, interestingly, um, and I know from talking to many of our brothers and sisters who are members of what is the Bawa Mahayadeen Fellowship. Uh, we were uh, drawn to uh, look for a teacher. Uh, we were being called, I believe. And for me, that began when I was 10 years old, uh, thinking that uh, I'm not getting the full story here. I mean, you know, we're in the church where, uh, you know, your parents who love you, they're giving you a narrative about, who we are and why we're here. But for me, it wasn't enough. I kept, in fact, I went to, you know, the minister of my church. He was, I uh, held a PhD in theology. And I kept saying, tell me the real reason that we're here. What is going on here? And, you know, he couldn't answer me. So anyway, that had been a search of mine for many years. And, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, there were many of us searching for a guru, as we said. And, um, you know, I happened, it's not happened. I, I always have to remind myself that nothing was just happenstance, that it was all planned, uh, though I knew nothing about the plan. But I learned about Bawa from one of his uh, students who was studying at the University of Pennsylvania, working on a doctorate in anthropology. And he had studied with Bawa in Sri Lanka and he wanted to bring Bawa to the United States. And so he reached out to a person who at that time was my yoga teacher. And she had him to come to the yoga class to talk about his teacher and uh, he, of course, was saying, I'm not a citizen. I need citizens to sign on to uh, this invitation and the visa documents and all of that. And he brought pictures of Bawa and some of Bawa's teachings that we read. Well, immediately in my heart, I 
made a connection through the photo and through the words on the page. And I volunteered uh, to help bring this teacher, at least make the applications uh, for this teacher to come and was uh, you know, so blessed to be a part of the 13 persons who met him at the airport when he first arrived. And you know, often people think that you must be nuts when you say that the first thing I saw was light coming from him. It was so powerful that it actually frightened me as he walked into the waiting room at the Philadelphia airport. And uh, then of course I saw after sort of the light dissipated, I saw the human form and I was already in love with that form and it was cemented on first sight. And so- um, how, did he how did he indicate that he was with you before he ever saw you? Um, you were, as I recall, you 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 were married, and your husband was incarcerated uh, because he he was a conscientious objector and refused to refused to fight, refused to be violent, refused to hate, and was in jail. And I know there was a relationship because that that I knew your I, I know your 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 former husband is a man of tremendous virtue and courage, guided by spirit. Putting his putting himself in allowing himself to go to jail over it, and and I know that that was guided. So what? How did how did you, you know, how did how did you get what? How did you know that there was a relationship to your teacher in that way, to our teacher in that way? Well, um, and I I just want to rush ahead to say <clears throat> yes. As to meeting Bawa and the first things he said to me, but let me just go back to say that in August, uh, I had gone with another person who became a uh, a disciple and a member of our fam uh, Bawa Mahayadeen, uh family. Uh, we had gone to New York to talk to a holy woman that I had been told to uh, go see. This was in August of 71. And my question to her was, uh, are you my teacher? I've been directed to you. And she said, oh no, I'm not your teacher. She said, but your teacher is coming and there may be no others like him left. That's the word she used. Uh, and he's coming uh, for you and all of his children here in America. And I mean, you know, I was like, coming from where? What are you talking about? She said, oh, he is so beautiful. And he will answer all the questions you have had all of your life. So now this was two months before Bawa came to the United States. I just want to mention that. So this uh, holy woman saw him already. Uh, but then when he we uh, left the airport and went to uh, the home where Bawa would be staying, and uh, he began talking to us all. And he said to me, he said, I have been watching you for many, many years. He said, and I have been watching you of late in your little car driving up the mountain. Now, uh, Michael was in the Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, you did have to go up a mountain to get to Lewisburg. He said, and I've been watching. And he says, and I know uh, your husband and I know why he's there. He has no business being there, and I'm going to get him out. So, I mean, you know, this is a man that just got off a plane from Sri Lanka. And uh, at the moment, I wasn't thinking about what the woman had told me. So I'm like, who is this person? Oh, my God, you know. So that was uh, one of many things he told me about his involvement 
in my life over many decades. I asked him, I asked him, how do you know these things? How do you know about everyone that you meet? I asked him and he said it was, <laughs> he said that if you drop a stone into a pond, the, the, uh, the, uh, the circles keep resonating outward. And he said like that, if you drop your heart in, if you drop your heart into the love and compassion of God, then you learn from the expanding resonance and that's in everybody's life. So I'm going to just read how he describes that love that gives us the capacity to know other lives as part of our own. And Zara and I met a human being who did this. And, and he was very emphatic in saying that this capacity of achieving this kind of love is a birthright of every human being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very, very emphatic about that. Yes. And, and that, you know, that... He was our teacher, but he, his emphasis was the universality of this. And he said that in his, his time here, he was like the a fruit behind the leaves. He was not trying to do a movement. He just had some people that he had a, a duty to do. And we have a duty to testify that we met someone who did this yes. and remind everybody that what, he, what I'm going to read to you is something that he, that he showed is real and he said, this is a level that all of us have the potential to reach. So he said, if this is, this is from a book on God's love. So he said, and I was there for this talk when he gave this and it resonated and just, just what he said about it. If, if you will open your heart, your actions, your wisdom and your conduct and look within, you'll see that every face is your face. Every nerve of every person each drop of their blood is your blood. Every sickness and suffering is yours. All hunger is your hunger. All poverty is your poverty. All sorrow is your sorrow. All lives are your life. You will experience this in your nerves, in your own body, and in what you see. When that state develops inside you, that is God's love. That is God's true love because all suffering is his suffering. All sorrow is his. All hunger is his. All poverty is his. All of it is inside him too. This is how God does his duty. Therefore, if you develop that love, you will do your duty in the same way. If that love develops, you will never hurt any other living thing. You will not cause any pain. You will not reject any life. And you will not torture any other life because if you hurt anyone, it will hurt you. The other side of that willingness to suffer with others, which is called compassion, he called it love, that we saw was this extraordinary capacity for joy. Now, if, you, if a wise person said, share the joy of others with yourself, people would only want to share the joy. But the secret of compassion, the secret is that in the liberation of others, you not only experience the freedom from their suffering, you experience the joy. So this man we're talking about had such a vibration of joy and happiness that literally, just to be in the room with him, you felt you were at home and you felt a level of joy that you feel when you get a newborn baby and you're holding it in your arms and it's like, oh my God, and that was sort of the state that he, that he that he invoked of this tremendous joyous celebration of life and this willingness this willingness to look as the buddha calls it the first noble truth the first noble truth in buddhism is there is affliction there is suffering there is old age sickness and death own it see it know it Intellectually, how could you call that a noble truth? I mean, it just sounds like, what a terrible deal. You're born into this world for suffering? That makes no sense, intellectually. But if your heart opens, and as Jesus said, what you do to the least amongst us, you do to me, right? As Gandhi said, if you want to know a good policy, imagine the least, the most disenfranchised person that you've ever seen and think, is this policy a blessing or a burden to them? 
This is how I lived with this man in Sri Lanka with the poorest of the poor. And he treated the poorest of the poor with the exact same love and intimacy as I saw him treat prime ministers as part of himself. Now, that Buddha's first noble truth becomes noble in experience because if you experience that reality that all of us are only here for a short time, just a little while ago we were pure little infants and a little while later we'll be dust, we'll just be in the ground, it's going to happen. When you really experience that, then all of a sudden you feel this intimacy with other lives. Uh, you feel it. You feel there's no one that you'll, you'll realize there's no one above you. There's, no, there's nobody who acquires property and power. They just have a, the one scene in the play and it's gone. The curtain will close soon. They're not above you. And no one is below you because that's what that love does. There's nobody. So you want to serve. You want to, you want to address that. So I want to share an experience that I had putting this teaching into practice. I was on the A train. It's a perfect metaphor. The A train is this. Remember, to take the A train, Duke Ellington's great thing. I'm on the A, the A train. It's the, the first train, the subway, the main subway in New York. It's a crowded subway, and I'm sitting in the subway. It's kind of, kind of sticky and funky, and, you know, it's New York. And I started looking at each of the people on the subway and imagining them as being pure little infants. You know, that a little while ago they were like little babies, and soon they'll be gone like me. But I was trying to imagine what they looked like when they were, you know, they just came into the world at one year old. And I just, I just saw it in some of, I saw it in some of the people. I didn't see it in everybody, but I saw it in enough of them that I, my heart just felt this joy to be together with them on the journey of the subway. But it was really larger than that. We're together in this journey of life. We're together here. And I was just filled with this sort of presence because my heart was open. I was filled with this presence of being there with them and that they were going to suffer like me and they were going to have joy like me. And then all of a sudden, people this is the New York subway. People started smiling at me. And it was this absolute affirmation of a truth that our teacher said, if you have that inner joy and peace, you will be able to make it come into the world in joy and peace. And lives will respond to that like that policeman when you were standing in front of him with those children to end apartheid in America. And now the world is in a state in which we're at war with nature. You can have plan A and plan B. There's no plan B. This International Day of Peace, the first peace we have to make is peace with nature. And we are nature. We are the air we breathe, which is the phytoplankton from the oceans. We are the water. We are, the, we are nature. We're not like watching nature. We are nature. So to come into, to stop the war with nature, we have to stop the war within ourselves. And part of the principle of stopping the war within ourselves is to treat other lives as we want to be treated. And we get it, we've got to get our institutions to do that. Now, our institutions, our institutions of law, states, corporations, were created with rules that we didn't know that we could go to war with nature when we created the multinational corporation. We didn't know it. And the only rule for the corporation's profit. We didn't know that we could destroy the world. When we created the nations, we didn't know that nations have a responsibility to the entire world. We didn't, we created nations, we didn't have nuclear weapons. We didn't have the ability to end the future. We didn't know it. Now we know it. So now we need to bring that wisdom that comes from the principles of inner peace into our lives and, inst and institutions. That's why today is International Day of Peace. Look, without the revelation of the Quakers, the United States Constitution wouldn't have this infusion of wisdom. We wouldn't have, we hold these truths to be self-evident, written in Philadelphia by Thomas Jefferson to remind us of our equality. It, we wouldn't have that. It was because there were people who connected with the deep inner peace of the presence of God's love, which is that description of feeling it of all lives. So I want to make sure, I want to lay out three principles for International Day of Peace 
and I would ask you to comment on them, Zohar, because you are a person for me who has been an example of putting the teaching, the great teaching that Bawa said was in every single wise wise uh, uh, prophet, wise person ever. So like, so he asked us to, what is that one teaching that you see in all the teachings? Find it. So I often think, you know, in the practices of religions, they say, well, oh, this is the teaching for all. Okay, so it doesn't make any sense to me because if the teaching for all is you have to drink this particular wine, there's parts of the world where they don't make wine. Aborigines people don't, don't make wine. So they can't, is, are the doors to heaven not open to them? And then in Islam, it says fast from sunrise to sunset. Well, that doesn't really work very well for indigenous Eskimos and Inuits up by the North Pole. They'd have one fast session and that, they die because it's six months of darkness. So there has to be something else in that message. The golden rule is there in all the traditions. Treat others as you want to be treated. But I propose another one for today, which is um, love people, use things. Because if you understand that people are connected to the whole and that people are sacred, then you understand we're not just talking about the forms of people, we're talking about their inner being to respect their dignity. And then the things that we create are states, corporations, ideas. Ideas are things. They have a beginning and an end. Love people, use things. Never love things and use people. People are not a means to fulfill some end of a thing. The purpose of the things is to enhance life, to enhance the beauty of uh, the beauty of knowing and the beauty of love. And the last but not least was a principle that that our teacher Bawa used to say: separate from yourself that which separates you from others. And like on a superficial level, that's like, I'm a black person, I'm a white person, I'm a male, I'm a female, uh, you know, all the, all the identity politics that Martin Luther King was so passionately against. I, I recently did a, uh, I, 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 I'm the senior advisor to the summits of the Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, and we were doing a press conference in Paris, and there were a bunch of very famous laureates, and I was, I was moderating, and there was this elderly black man next to me. I said, who, I didn't know who he was. Who are you? And he said, I'm Clarence Jones. And I said, I, I don't know who's Clarence Jones. He said, I'm Martin Luther, I was Martin Luther King's speechwriter. And I was like, I thought God was Martin Luther King's speechwriter, right? You know? And he explained to me the, that Martin Luther King was very much against identity politics because his point was we are one human family. We are one human family, and that is the point. So, so the idea of, of overly identification with religion, nation, gender, etc., those are real, but that's not our core. I, that's not our core. So he said, anger, falsehood, jealousy, pride, vanity, lust, these are things that affirm the illusion of being separate. Love, compassion, patience, justice, tolerance, they liberate us from egocentricity, and they not only bring us together as humans, they bring us together with the soul that makes us human. And we need to be that and then bring it into our institutions. That's International Day of Peace. That's the day the United Nations today has declared is that day. I heard Zelensky yesterday at the UN talk about the need for greater justice. We don't hear enough about the quality of God's justice. The reason that the UN is its weakness is that every that the whole world doesn't have an equal say in it. It's disproportionate. One country in the P5 can veto everything, and right now we have one that's gone full rogue. And uh, so, it he, he, his his Zelensky Zelensky made a call for greater justice, and I boiled it down to this: No one washes a rental car. If you're not participating, you're not going to perfect the institution. So I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters in the create in the community of spiritually awakening people. We have to wash the car. It's not the state, the places we live, the communities we live, the states we live in. They're not rental cars. They're our cars. We're put in this world to be part of this, and the love that we have 
found within ourselves, we need to bring it into action. We need to go from the head to the heart to the hand. This is our time. This is our responsibility because there's danger and suffering and we have to step up. And my sister Zahara is an example who, had, who, 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 who heard the call as a teenager and has lived a life of nobility in that. And the last thing is when you get that thing, that message, then you start to develop skills that are commensurate with your proclivities. It might be scholarship, it might be just being a nice neighbor. But Zahara, you developed uh, the skill of a great scholar. And I wanted to make sure that people know about your writings and your the recent book that's come out about your journey so that people can read it and be inspired by the, 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 the that you have, you are walking the talk. And so let people know about that book, about your story, please. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know we are over time, but uh, as a student of mine, a former student of mine, uh, worked for seven years to uh, document my work and that of my former husband, Michael Simmons, in a book called Stayed on Freedom. And it's available in bookshops everywhere. Uh, but more important than talking about our lives is talking about the movements that we were engaged in that were attempting and are still attempting to, uh, first of all, put into practice God's love, God's compassion, God's tolerance, uh, and to bring about peace in the world for all of humankind and for all of our non-human uh, beings. Amen. Ben Bowler and all the people in Unity Earth unify. <laughs> May God continue to expand our hearts so that we become the, the, the movement of hearts without borders. All Amen. praises to the goodness that's blessing and guiding, guiding us. Amen. 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 And thank you so much. And this was a very rich exploration of inner peace to outer peace and bringing in um, those extraordinary encounters with Bawa uh, that you both had. I really uh, enjoyed and loved your stories, Zahara. And we look forward to hearing more from you. I have so much to ask you. I'd love to know. And I'm sure many other people are the same. So I hope uh, this is just part one of an ongoing dialogue. Uh, thank you for being with us. Blessings and gratitude. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thank you.